Dr. Philip Johns. Uh, he is at, he's an assistant professor at uh, Yale and US, the Science Division at Yale and U.S. College in Singapore. I'll just say a little bit about him. Uh, he did his BA in Carleton College in Minnesota in the USA, and then he did his master's and PhD at the University of Chicago. He's, his research interest is in the evolution of social behavior, uh, stopped by flies, and that's part of the reason why he moved here to Southeast Asia, so he could be closer to studying his uh, favorite uh, study organism. So right now he does work on the evolution and genomics of stock eye flies in uh, Peninsula Malaysia and Borneo, I guess, in Borneo. And ever since he came to Singapore, he developed an interest in uh, the smooth coated otters of Singapore, and he's been studying them as a side project ever since. So I'm happy to introduce Dr. Philip Johns, and I'll hand it over to so in some ways, this story begins before I went to Singapore. I've come to Singapore. I've only been here a year and a half, so I'm, I'm new to the area. But a lot of things have happened recently that really, really kind of struck me. Um, the, these are pictures that have gotten a lot of attention. The picture on the left is a mountain lion in Los Angeles. And it's not the only mountain lion in Los Angeles. It's right underneath the Hollywood sign, this famous Hollywood sign. And these sorts of things really, really struck me. The one on the right is a leopard in Mumbai. You know, and again, it's inside the city of Mumbai. These are big cats, big predators that are living in cities. But one of the things that's impressive about these is that these are both pictures that were picked up on camera traps. Right? We've, we're starting to get technology that lets us do things easily and relatively quickly that we couldn't uh, do before. <coughs> camera traps are big in the news because of what they're picking up. These are just a few news stories that have come out in the last couple of years. Uh, camera traps emerge as a key tool to wildlife research. <clears throat> camera traps uh, revolutionize wildlife research. Wisconsin deploys huge trail camera system for studying wildlife and picks up coyotes. Coyotes are one of the great success stories in North America. Uh, selfies from the Animal Kingdom, a re recent book uh, by Roland Kays. Uh, pho pho photographing wildlife without a photographer. Again, this is making the news all the time because camera traps are becoming very, very common. <clears throat> this is one that came out even more recently where people are starting to put camera traps let me talk a little bit more slowly. The coffee kicked in, obviously. Uh, <clears throat> people are putting camera traps in places that they wouldn't before, in trees. This is something that interests my colleagues and I because one of our side projects has to do with sound in the forest and the competition for different frequencies among things that make loud noises in the forest. It's things not just like insects, but like gibbons. And if they're actually competing for particular frequencies in which they can sing. So the idea of putting camera traps or sound recording equipment way up in the canopy is really interesting to me in particular, but it also gives people a chance to do things they couldn't do before. I know people who have studied um, arboreal primates and they've been hobbled by their ability not to brachiate. Not the monkeys or the other primates, they can brachiate fine, it's the researchers. And if you're on the ground trying to follow gibbons, and the gibbons are literally swinging through the trees, it's difficult to do. So this gives us literally another dimension with which we can study things. And I think that's important and interesting. <clears throat> this is from Roland Cases. Uh, Roland Cases is kind of a strong proponent of citizen science and camera traps. But he just published a kind of coffee table edition of candid creatures, of pictures of animals from camera traps. And the graph on the right shows the frequency of scientific articles that use uh, camera traps and field cameras over the last several years. And it's, it's literally an exponential increase. These things are becoming common. <clears throat> and the reason they're becoming common isn't really a secret. So this is the first camera trap, Frank Chapman, and he made a glass plate camera in the 20s. And you can imagine, I mean, think of this, a glass plate camera, one of these things where you actually have film on glass and you have to pull it out, you know, with some sort of um, remote sensor, which is probably a string to catch things. The first digital cameras came out in 2006, and since then, their cost has just been plummeting, right? These are no longer the tools of scientists. They're no longer the tools of, of you know, some kind of elite class. These are things that almost anybody can afford, just like other digital cameras. So now, a pretty good 8 megapixel uh, trail cam is less than 100 bucks. And this is from the National Geographic website, so $100 US. Uh, it's certainly not the best, and it's probably dropped another 50 bucks since I posted this up the first time. Uh, anybody can buy one, and anybody does, right? So it's not just that we have uh, trail cams, it's that we have trail cams that people are using for citizen science. These are a few uh, groups, most of them are Facebook groups, 
but groups where people are looking at different kinds of animals using trail cams. And again, these aren't scientists, they're not academics, they're not necessarily with wildlife organizations, they're just people looking at, for example, cougars. And it's not just looking at cougars, sometimes it's looking at an individual cat, right? So the friends of P22 mountain lion, these are people who are interested in a single cat that's roaming Los Angeles, um, Silver Lake, around there. And people are, are looking at other aspects, how DSLR camera traps are capturing stunning wildlife. So these are the techie people, right? People who, just, who don't just want a $100 trail cam that they can hang on a tree, but people who want really nice pictures, and they're doing what they can to take extremely good pictures with some kind of motion sensor. Uh, there are other organizations, and you guys probably know about some of these, right? Uh, Cameras for Conservation is actually an organization where you can donate cameras that you don't think are good enough for your own hobbying activities to people who are studying cats, right? So the idea here is not just to, we mostly have trail cams, but some of us are upgrading our trail cams and trying to think what to do with the ones we have. So we can donate them to people who can use them for science. Again, think of what this means. All of a sudden, people who aren't scientists have better equipment than scientists have, and they're giving their hand-me-downs to the scientists. That's actually not that unusual. Um, another article that came out in the last year or so says, limitations of recreational camera traps for wildlife management and conservation research, a practitioner's perspective. They're basically saying, if you're setting up camera traps, here are some things to be aware of if you want to collect real data. Um, and it's sort of a how-to guide for people who are, are doing uh, hobbyist work but maybe have other aspirations. Right, so this is one kind of technology that's gotten much, much better over the last few years. Um, and because it's gotten better and it's gotten cheaper, everybody, and by everybody I mean people who want to, have started to use it. But it's certainly not the only kind. Phones and cameras, right? Obviously, we've had similar advances in mobile technology. Most of us have an 8 or 10 or 12 megapixel camera in the pocket. Right? And so this really interested me because <clears throat> we can use this to collect data too. And because everybody's got one of these, I think the potential is there to get very good data, or at least really, really um, widely collected data. Um, and I don't think people who have camera phones necessarily think of them as data collection tools. So this idea has intrigued me for the last year, and it's something that I wanted to explore at least a little bit. And that's where we come to um, the next thing, which is the intersection between studying animal behavior, camera phones, and citizen science. So I wanted to explore how everyday phone video can be used to study animal behavior and talk about some of the concerns related to that, including social and technical concerns, and use uh, Singapore's otters as a test case. If you're not familiar with Singapore's otters, this is what they look like. Right? Exactly, exactly, aww, right? that's exactly the right way to think about them. So these are smooth-coated otters, and they returned to Singapore recently. They went away from Singapore around 1930, and they had been gone almost completely until arguably about 10 years ago, and very recently, in the last couple of years, one family in particular has established itself publicly. Um, there are other families, there are at least half a dozen families in and around Singapore right now, uh, Smooth-coated otters are pretty big. They're around 10 kilos as adults, so they're a good-sized animal. Um, they're gregarious, they're neophilic, they're curious, um, they do cool stuff, and they're really, really active when they're active. So people seem to like them. Uh, one family in particular has shown up around Bichon Park, and uh, it's actually been the subject now of two documentaries. Just so you can see what these guys look like. Those are my students. That's not my student.
Right? So there's a ton of behavior going on in this. There's just an, an amazing amount of behavior. This was, if not my first phone camera video of, a, of the otters, it's one of the first. Uh, and what we can see here is, is pups. There's at least three kinds, maybe four kinds of vocalizations. There's begging. Uh, you might not have noticed it, but when they beg, they actually have kind of a growl. It's this <laughs> noise. We'll hear it again. Don't worry. Uh, we, we saw provisioning by one of the adults to the pups. We saw something called sprinting, where they poop in the same place. And actually, what I didn't know is that I was sitting in their favorite poop spot, <laughs> which is why they got so close to me when they didn't know me. Uh, the three that are here are actually year-old pups, or nearly year-old pups. And this is because these guys have communal brood care. So the parents rear one brood of pups, and this, that brood of pups helps to rear another brood of pups. And they mature and leave when they're around two years old. Incidentally, these guys are just about at the age where they're going to leave uh, the, the family, and it'll be really interesting to see what happens after that. I like to think that when you study animal behavior, you go off into the wilds of some place really, really strange and unusual, like Malaysia. No. <laughs> OK, Malaysia is wonderful. It, it, but, but Kuala Lumpur, not necessarily wild. This is in downtown Singapore. This is almost as, as close to downtown Singapore as you can get. And I've got otters doing interesting things around me. Now, I've got to give you a little bit of my bias. My bias is I like otters, I like carnivores, I love the idea of carnivores returning to urban habitats. But there are a million things that live in cities that you can use camera phones to study. There are a lot of reasons we can use the tools we already have to study things around. Um, and otters are one example, and they happen to be really, really uh, charismatic. So let's look at a few other things. Uh, there's a group of otter watchers in Singapore, and I wouldn't have known about the otters. Nobody would if it hadn't been them. These are uh, mostly amateur, but a few professional photographers. There are 10 or 20 regular otter watchers. There are dozens of occasional otter watchers, people who might go out on weekends looking for otters. Um, and among them, they watch the otters almost daily. Uh, they're doing this um, because they want to collect nice pictures and post them online. They're doing this merely as a hobby, and merely isn't a good word here. But what they're doing, incidentally, is collecting really, really good data because they're getting unbelievable footage of some of the things that otters are doing. Um, and I think a lot of the people who are very active in this have dreams of grandeur. You know, they really want to sell a film to BBC or sell a film to National Geographic. And some of them have done that. Some of them have been successful that way. Um, <clears throat> but they rely heavily on social media to talk about where otters are and to share information. This includes the usual things, emails and text, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, WhatsApp, I'm sure people are using Snapchat, uh, and you know, whatever's going to become popular next week. So sharing information and collecting information on these tools seems like something that's already in place. I want to talk a little bit about the otters. Uh, they're charismatic mesofauna, so this is why people like them. They make fun faces. One of the projects that I'm, I'm working on a little bit is actually trying to figure out authors and distinguish among them based on facial recognition software. I haven't gotten very far. Okay, I don't want you to think, oh yes, I've got this app and you can take a picture of it, but I've got permission to develop that app. Um, and you can see they make lovely faces and it's really, really easy to be anthropomorphic. Uh, I think one of the consequences of having grown up in sort of a Disney world is that we're sometimes too anthropomorphic. Um, and, and one of the things that you can see, even in some of the uh, pictures I'll show you, is that what looks like it's fun to us is actually really serious business to being an otter. The otter watchers have done tons of very, very good things. Um, <clears throat> so this was a, a picture that they took, oh, eight months ago or so of the otter family running across the road and one of them almost got hit by a car. Um, and, and the otter watchers put a lot of pressure on the local government to put up traffic signs. To put up traffic signs just saying, you know, look, slow down. You don't have to drive quickly right here. There are other things going on. And they were successful. It worked. Uh, there are all other signs warning the public about otters near where the otters frequent, saying things like, you know, don't try and touch the otters, don't feed the otters, but also information signs that say things like, here are behaviors you can look at for the otters. And people see these signs, and some of them are slightly humorous, uh, but, but people see these signs, and it, it, it adds a lot of, I don't know, it adds to the, the kind of attraction of, of downtown Singapore. Some other things that otters did, uh, yeah, they're terribly ugly, these animals. Uh, <laughs> So other things that Audrey did was they rescued a pup that had been abandoned by its family. 
So there's a, a heavy rainstorm. The otters often live underneath bridges or in culverts, and one of them flooded. The family took all their pups but one away, and they accidentally, we think, left this one pup behind. The otter watchers counted how many pups they took away, and they knew there was one missing. So they went to the, the former holt. They could hear it squeaking, and it actually started to wash away. And one of the otter watchers, who was not a young man, uh, swam to this holt and got the pup. But there was some sort of discussion. They left it there for about a day, brought it to um, an animal rescue organization called Acres, <coughs> who brought it to the local zoo, which is an excellent zoo. And the pup was actually on the edge of death. It was dehydrated. It was I don't know if it's literally hypothermic, but it wasn't doing well. They beefed up the pup, found the family where it had moved to, brought them the pup in the box, opened up the box, pup didn't want to leave. Right? I mean, why would you? It had been fed for a week. <laughs> so they changed their strategy. But what was interesting is when they, they finally got the pup to leave the box, I think they encouraged it to, to leave the box, pups started squeaking, parents started squeaking, parents ran over and grabbed the pup. And they have all of this on video. So my point, other than to tell kind of a cute story, is uh, to emphasize how much the otter watchers care, and genuinely care, about these otters that they, they watch. <clears throat> so what studies and behavior need, and again, what I'm interested in is using kind of popular technology to study animal behavior using citizen science. But we need some kind of good record of behavior. And you know, when I was your age, and I can say the, that in the old man voice, when I was your age, we used you know, a stopwatch and a notebook. That's not a very efficient way to collect data. Even before I came to Singapore, I gave my students what I thought were really good high-def videos, uh, video recorders that cost you know, on the order of 100 bucks. You guys would laugh at these. You would just laugh at these because any camera you have on a phone that you bought in the last two years is so much better than these small, cheap video recorders. But those were worlds better than what you could buy for $500, $1,000 10 years ago. So the availability and cheapness of video equipment has gotten so good that I think we have to think about collecting data with video. You need some kind of time stamp. You need to know when the video was collected. And you need some kind of location information, like a geotag. Now, and you need the ability to share that location easily for citizen science, right? If the otters are near me, I want to tell my friends. I want to be able to say, here's where the otters are. Let's go take a look at them. That's super, super important. And you also need the ability to upload and download and organize information quickly, right? You don't want to have 100 gigs of video on your phone. You want to be able to get rid of that so you can take more pictures of otters, obviously. <clears throat> right, social media does all this. So you'd say, well, why don't you just use social media? But it turns out social media isn't very good at doing any of this, or at least doing all of it at the same time. Uh, I'm going to talk about some issues having to do with sharing information, and some issues having to do with technical things. So the pros of social media are that, almost by definition, it's easy to use, right? It's made to be easy to use. If you've ever used a program that was developed by biologists, you recognize that's not universal, right? Biologists make crappy programs. We just do. <laughs> Facebook makes a pretty good program. Twitter is a pretty good program. WhatsApp is a pretty good program that Facebook bought. Um, it's what we do anyway, and most of this is designed to be mobile, which is very good for citizen science. The cons are that there's lots of extraneous information. If you're scrolling through your Facebook feed or scrolling through a WhatsApp conversation trying to find where the otters are, it's, it's an enormous waste of time and effort. And, and the other thing is that people who are engaged in citizen science want to be part of a group, but they also want to share the things that people share in groups, like what they had for lunch, um, you know, what was on TV last night. And all of that is important. I don't want to take away from the importance of that. But again, if you want to know where the otters are and you're looking at you know, a dozen selfies of people's breakfasts, it's just it's a lot less fun. So sometimes it's difficult to find the pertinent information. Um, that's not as damning as some other things, right? Downloading and sorting information is often an issue. Uh, when I download videos that are put up on social media, I lose a lot of video quality. If I'm trying to identify an otter based on the pattern of spots on its whisker pads, 
and I'm trying to steal somebody's video, steal and quote somebody's video from, from YouTube or from uh, Facebook, and I can't see those spots. It's a real cost. Also, the geotagging is often lost or disabled when people upload videos from one source to another. So if people are uploading to WhatsApp and I'm downloading, I lose the geotag. I lose the location information. There's a reason for that. Um, and the reason has to do with a series of incidents that happened about four years ago. Uh, and, and here are some headlines from that. This is from 2012. Four Square Stalker Problem. The creepy app isn't just stalking women without their knowledge. It's a wake-up call about Facebook privacy. <clears throat> and why Foursquare really killed the creepy stalking app Girls Around Me, right? So Foursquare, which I don't think anybody uses anymore, used to post locations and pictures and people's you know, Facebook feed or anything else. And so you could go through this and just find attractive people who were near you and basically chat them up or do whatever else it is that you wanted to do. But understandably, people were creeped out by this and they stopped it. Likewise, Facebook had a pretty good map app uh, a few years ago, it ended about 2012, where if you uploaded your pictures to Facebook, it would pin them and put them on, on a Google map. For me, that would be wonderful. If I could just go to somebody's Facebook page and find out where they saw the otters, that would be lovely. They got rid of it, and they got rid of it for this reason. Now here, in social media, the issue is social stalkers. But in wildlife, the same issue exists. So, <clears throat> similar concerns in wildlife. This is a paper from a few years ago. Scientific descriptions can imperil species. Um, two new species of the genus something something, a kind of lizard from southern China. And this is where the authors refused to release the location of these newly described species because they thought, and perhaps rightly, that um, collectors would come and take them for the trade. Poachers using science papers to tar target newly discovered species. And in fact, if you look around the literature, there are more articles about poachers, not just people who are collecting live animals, but poachers who are using the scientific literature to find out where to find endangered animals that they can kill and sell. This is a real problem. Um, the app that has existed for more than 10 years that's intended for citizen science is called iNaturalist. I don't want to do like a product review, but one of the reasons it's open source and I'm actually trying to change it now one of the reasons I don't use it is that it obscures the location of what people see. So, and it only does this for animals that are on the IUCN list. The otters are technically vulnerable. So what happens is, and this has happened to me, it's how I figured it out, I take a bunch of pictures of otters, I take some videos, I upload them to the site, and I'm like, great, it pins the locations, it grabs the geotags. And then I go to iNaturalist and look at them, and it tells me that the otters I saw were in the Chengi airport, in the Straits of Malacca, um, in the Johor Straits, you know, tens of kilometers sometimes from where I saw them. And it's doing that intentionally. It's adding a random variable to the location so that poachers cannot find what I found. Well, that's great, and I, I applaud the effort. I, I literally applaud the effort. But that makes it useless for citizen science. If my goal is to share information with people so that they can find the otters and take videos so I can get data, if it's telling them that the otters are 10 kilometers away from where they really are, that doesn't help them very much. All right, there are other considerations, uh, and these are all considerations that my students and I came uh, in, came face to face to last year. Storage, videos take a lot of space. Ease of use, iNaturalist is made for people who are used to using desktops. If you're over 30, you might not know this, but people don't use desktops if they're under 30. Uh, the same thing with Flickr. So a lot of the apps that are out there are not actually very easy to use. Mobile, uploadability, uh, things that, are, that rely on very fast wireless connections aren't always that easy. And then there are other things to think about, like having additional lenses for your phone. I'm really interested in people using phones. But you'll see from some of the videos I'll show you that phone um, clarity isn't as good as professional clarity by a long shot. And that's especially true if you're looking at something far away. There's really no good solution now. Uh, people are doing hacks, I'm doing a hack, but I can't just point you to one app and say, this is the app you should use, because there isn't one. Uh, there are different issues with sampling. I don't think I'm going to talk about this right now, but we can talk about it uh, after. 
Um, I do want to show you some of the things that we're trying to study. Uh, so one of the things we're looking at is vigilance. Otters are vigilant. Their vigilance behavior is pretty obvious. They make their neck vertical. Um, what's really cool about the otters in Singapore is that some of them are extremely comfortable around people. I think they're using us as watchdogs. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Um, I think some of the groups are as bold as they are because when they're around people, they don't have to waste as much time being vigilant. And I think there's data we can collect and test this. I think there are also patterns of vigilance that are related to the age of the pups, and that's worth uh, looking at. Uh, one of the things that, is this a great picture? Obviously not mine. Uh, one of the things that's really cool about Singapore is that it's full of water monitors. I'm sure you guys have lots of water mon monitors here too. The water monitors and the otters interact, right? They interact regularly. Um, here you can see a half-sized uh, water monitor directly below two pups. And the pups, one of them is eating, you can actually see it. This is what monitors do, they get the leftovers, right? They, they do a lot of scavenging. So it's in their best interest to hang around the otters. The otters do not like the monitors, and they tolerate them sometimes, but a lot of times they do not. I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures and videos. Here's a mostly grown otter encountering a monitor, and here's the outcome of that encounter. If you can't see what's going on, there's the monitor. Right? So the otter has literally chased a monitor lizard up a tree. It's not a very big monitor. Um, here's another one, and there's actually, a, again, just admire all the behaviors that are happening here. So they chase the monitor out of the water. I love this. And the first thing they do is they check each other out. They do some owl grooming, some uh, social buffering behavior, which is really common both in otters and across a lot of mammals. But you know, one of them chases the monitor out, and another one comes right up to it and basically says, are you okay? Are you okay? Are we cool? Is everything cool? Right, so that's obviously somebody who's got a better camera than me. This is from my phone camera, and it's in my, my current prime otter watching location. That thing in the middle is the monitor. The otter has its tail. The monitor gets away, but then watch what happens. The other otters can hear somebody else's phone. Are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? I'm alright. Right. What happened? It's okay. It's cool. <laughs> Now, even more happened in this interaction. So the monitor uh, walked up a few meters, and there were a bunch of pups that were on the bank, and the pups started to investigate, small pups, uh, started to investigate the monitor, and they got closer and closer and closer to the monitor, <clears throat> and then and the monitor finally takes its tail and whips one of the pups in the face, and then the pups run away, right? Um, I do not personally, but I have seen video from the otter watchers uh, where a monitor swims up to a pup, and licks its face, and you see this big blue tongue, tongue crossing the pup's face. Some of these monitors are quite large. They're as tall as I am, if I were laying down. Uh, and I'm virtually certain that they could be a threat to small pups. This family, what happens is the parents, and it's a pretty big family, it's got eight otters in it, the parents swim in front of the rest of the, the otters, and they'll systematically clear the monitor lizards out of the way, out of the water in front of them. And the monitors run. They get up on the bank and they run. They don't swim away. They run, run away from the otters on the bank. But it's hard to interpret that as anything but the parents chasing the otters, I'm sorry, chasing the monitors away from the pups. Uh, people haven't studied this systematically. I think uh, my students and I have as much data as anybody on it. Um, there are other things that are really great. Uh, there are pup personalities. Uh, one of the sad things is that the big family at Bichon, which is called Bichon 10, uh, lost one of its pups. Uh, the pups are pretty full grown, but they went from Bichon 10 to Bichon 9. Anyway, one of the pups in particular had a personality where he was always the last pup. He was a straggler, and he almost always was carrying a fish. 
and it was really cute. And you know, you kind of look forward to the dopey pup because here were nine nine otters running along the shore, and then you know, ten meters, fifteen meters, twenty meters behind was a dopey pup carrying a fish. You know, kind of. And then periodically they lose him, and you know, the otters are running around squeaking him. I might even have that video here, squeaking, looking for him, looking for him, and he's like off in the weeds eating a fish. You know, but the fact that you've got these these otters with personalities, it's not just endearing. It's something that we can address questions, real questions, evolutionary questions, e ecological questions with, if we can tell the otters apart. Um, otters play. Uh, this is an otter juggling a leaf. Uh, we often see the pups juggling stones. Small clawed otters, which is the closely related species of otter, are the ones that you see most frequently doing this. But again, we're watching play behavior from four meters, five meters, six meters away. We're not watching it with you know, a spotting scope from a half a mile away or anything like that, because the otters are habituated enough that we can get this close. Um, begging behavior. I think begging behavior is really, really interesting. And the otters have, like I said, this very particular uh, begging call. Uh, here's a pup and its mom, and the pup has just taken a fish from its mom. Um, I'm going to show you a video of this. This is, one of, this is actually a camera phone video. Listen. favorite video. <laughs> but I, you might not have been able to hear it, but it wasn't just going pit, pit, pit. It was going pit, 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 pit. And then it, when I did it enough, the mom was like, okay, you want some fish? Like, yeah, that's mine. <laughs> and it went away. But there's variation in the duration of that pipping. And I think it's a function of age. And it's also a function of this interaction between the parents or the older siblings, because the, the older siblings also feed the younger siblings and the younger siblings. Um, these are some uh, videos that a student of mine ha has collected very recently. We're looking at the different sounds they make. I'm not going to show you the whole videos because some of them are kind of long, but this is the lost otter. So this is a, a nearly full-grown otter, and it just kind of lost track of the rest of the uh, group. By the way, a group of otters is called a romp. Okay, so we've got sound analyses of those. I, I suspect those are uh, not distress calls. Uh, this is her analysis. I think these are just general contact calls. You hear this all the time. When otters go hunting, fishing, they often go off in twos and threes, and they'll, they'll swim. I mean, they don't literally porpoise. Actually, sometimes they do porpoise. But they'll swim together, and they kind of make these contact calls as they go out. And I think this is it's almost exactly like you know, ducks or anything else that are quacking, kind of saying, this is where I am. Where are you? Marco Polo. Marco Polo. You know, something along those lines. Um, I, I don't think this is a distress call. But watch how these guys respond. not an otter. So I think there are, I, 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 there's more of this, but I think there are a lot of lessons, one of which is that otters can't count. 
right? And because the rest of the otters have done their foraging, they're back in their holt, and again, we've got a holt like this. It's just, you know, underneath the bridge, and you can get this close and watch what the otters are doing. Almost unheard of in the wild. There is a group in Goa that's actually doing something quite similar with wild otters, but, but, but hasn't certainly been done before this year or last year. And you can watch these reactions. It's really hard not to watch that and see, you know, the sleeping otter say, wait, 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 Timmy fell in a well? And, you know, kind of running off to, to see where Timmy is. That's the Disney idea. We don't want to anthropomorphize too much. But seriously, they're, they're pretty clearly reacting to this contact call that the other otter is making. Stop, I don't want you here. And again, we're just trying to analyze these calls, analyze them, typify them. But if we can analyze them and just put them out there, then other people, when they hear these calls, can do more interesting things. And you can see there's the calls we heard at the beginning, then there's slightly different calls we're hearing from within the halt, which sound like they're in response to that contact call, etc. cetera. Um, and then just getting tons and tons of information. You know, a lot of what any animal does, if you study animal behavior, is not much. I tell my animal behavior students that animals misbehave. But we are getting these, these short video clips like this where there's just a ton going on. I mean, already there have been three kinds of calls. Fourth, you hear the whining in the background. Some play with the older pups. and there's more whining going on. Um, if you know Singapore and you know where the flyer is, these are right underneath the flyer. So this is about as close to downtown Singapore as you can get. Um, it, it's, it's pretty impressive. And again, we can just catalog a bunch of different kinds of calls that they're making in these interactions. I, I don't want to go through all of them, um, but it's pretty impressive. And, and I think some of these more co complicated calls, even though here they're a little bit distorted by echo, they could be pointing at something really, really interesting. The authors clearly can recognize each other. Some of that has to be by smell. They have these, these very obvious uh, smell sites, sprite sites, where they poo and pee, and there's some pheromonal inter interaction going on as well. At the same time, it's not what they're using in close range, right? So they're using some combination of other senses. Some of it has to be visual, but I suspect some of it is, is vocal. And one of the things that would be cool to find out, we need a pretty big sample size, is if there's actually individual differences among these sounds. And that certainly exists in other gregarious organisms, other organisms that live in big groups. So it's something worth at least exploring. And it's something that I think we can explore with things like citizen science. Just one more video from uh, that particular student. Right, they're, they're terribly ugly. <laughs> I tell my students they shouldn't get closer than about three meters from the otters. I think the student ignored that advice. <laughs> So again, that's, that's a vocalization. I, I, I'm not even going to pretend to understand the function of it, but uh, it's something that you wouldn't get ordinarily, certainly by traditional means, you know, maybe with camera traps that you put right in a hole. And there are people trying to do things like that. But, uh, and, and just again, more different, more calls, different sonograms, including that kind of weird whining just at the end. Sorry. Um, <coughs> 
And then we've seen these other behaviors, and this one is, is one of the most interesting ones, which basically had not been described before the Singapore otter watchers saw it. And this is another student who saw this. Watch closely. This is when the pups were quite small. Right, so what's up with that? What's going on here? I mean, it's got, I've got it in the title, but, but, but what's going on? You can answer. What's going on? They're hurting the fish for the bank. Right. Now, this sounds like, oh my gosh, aren't otters smart? And of course, otters are very smart. This is a picture, again, by this guy who calls himself Fast Snail, which is a joke on its own. But look at the size of these fishes. Right? Look, look at how big they are compared to the otters. These are barely a snack, right? You know, it's really tempting to say, oh, this is a clever thing that otters are doing, and they're doing it because it's a more efficient way to go fishing, more efficient way to go fishing. Um, but if they're only getting prey this size, does that make sense? And think about the context that they're doing this in. Right? Who's involved when you've got this kind of herding behavior that you just watched? Loudly, somebody said it. Right, right. So if you've got a, a parents doing something that's costly, changing their own behavior, the parents' behavior, doing something that's costly, only catching little fishes with the young, what do you think they're actually doing? Here? They're training their young, right? So we're actually watching them train their young to fish. Now it's true these guys do go out in groups even when they're big. They do go out in groups, but they don't go out in groups like this. They have these very loose coalitions where they might be 10, 20, 30 meters away from each other, and they go fishing. I've seen this after a storm in, in the rivers, in quotes, uh, where they'll go up the side of the river, and there's a big current down the middle of the river, so all the little fish apparently hang out along the edges. And the family will go up along the edge, and the small fish are literally jumping to get away from the otters. They're jumping you know, half a meter ahead of them. Um, but this is, I think, how parents teach the young how to fish. And seeing that kind of training, it's not that it's that rare, but it's rare enough. Anyway, just showing you uh, some of the small fishies <coughs> and how big they are compared to, you saw the size of the big yellow fish that they were catching. Um, and then, you know, there are these unbelievable um, shots, and this is why the otter watchers go out, to get pictures like this. But just look at the different size of the fish there. These are the three juveniles, you know, and the domes and the super trees that are kind of the icon of downtown Singapore. You know, so it's, it's, it's amazing to me that I've got the chance to watch these uh, mesophonic carnivores in about as urban an environment as you can get in Southeast Asia. And I was just talking to the vet and I was saying that I think we really should consider uh, reintroductions. I'd be willing to take a few leopards off your hand and put them into Singapore <laughs> just to see what would happen you know, on a trial basis. But, but barring that, this is kind of what we got going on. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> they, they are engaging. There's no toys about it. It's hard not to fall in love with them. Um, it's just, they're, they're so cute. Nobody's done anything except clean up Singapore's rivers. So Singapore's rivers used to be terrible, and now they're, they're okay. 
that, that's come at kind of a weird cost. Singapore is extremely manicured, um, which upsets some people because, you know, I want to see a little bit of wild forest. And a lot of these rivers are really concrete troughs. But they're clean concrete troughs, and they're clean concrete troughs that have fish in them. Uh, whereas they used to be incredibly, incredibly dirty rivers that had bloated pigs and cats and dogs. There's a, a perhaps apocryphal uh, story, I believe, about Lee Kuan Yew swimming across one of the rivers. You know, he made it one of his goals to clean the rivers. And there's a river called Dead Chicken River because so many dead chickens. There's actually the Kalong, which these otters are on now. And um, so they cleaned it up. You know, it improved a thousandfold. And he was supposed to have swum across it. And what people didn't tell him is like. Minutes before he swam across it to demonstrate how clean it was, a dead dog actually did wash down the river. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and nobody told him. It's like, let's just, just let's leave that alone. We sleeping for dead dogs a lot. But nobody's doing anything specific for the, these authors. And that's not quite true. I saw a plan, which I hope was a joke, where N Parks was going to build manufactured pulps for the authors. Right? right now, they're living wherever authors live. Um, these guys uh, forage in mangroves when they're not in Singapore, and so I suspect their holts have to be high enough out of the water that they can stay dry and covered from the rain. So these uh, bridges, you know, the premises underneath bridges are actually pretty ideal, but the plan I saw, again, I hope it was a joke, had these sort of bunker-like concrete structures that people were going to bury so the otters had a place to go. You know, they're otters. They probably have holes underneath logs or things like that in the wild. It's, it's kind of silly to say, oh, we're going to build otter condos. Yeah. <laughs> At the same time, and, and I mean no disrespect to anybody uh, from Singapore, this is sort of a Singaporean mindset. I mean, I used to joke, you know, the super trees, which are beautiful, they're gorgeous, but it, there's this Singaporean mindset that's like, let's take trees, make something that does what trees do, only make them bigger and better, and they glow in the dark. <laughs> and I feel like you're sort of doing the same thing with otter bolts, if that's not a common cheat. But no, nobody's actively saying, you know, let's say the otters. They just came back. He basically asked my question, so... Presentation. Um, so I was just wondering, with citizen science being the approach now, how do we address issues of like poachers uh, knowing the identity and the location? Right. It, it's there's no easy answer to that. Um, what I'm doing and it's supposed to be done is I'm making it proprietary. By, and by proprietary, I simply mean I'm only giving it to my students or people I know app where they can upload videos, and all I wanted to, to do, it, all I want this app to do is allow them to upload videos to a, a repository and keep the geotag and timestamp. So that I basically have a spreadsheet I can go to with everybody's videos, and I know where and when they took the video. Um, and you know, I'm giving people instructions. I'm saying, take at least one solid minute of video. Um, but don't get closer than three meters from the, the authors. You know, very, very simple, easy to follow um, rules, but I'm only distributing it to my friends. In a way, that makes the problem worse. Because what happens with things like WhatsApp is that WhatsApp users, you know, they share information with their friends, but they don't share it with the scientists. When I first moved to Singapore a year and a half ago, I talked to another American who had been at the American Museum of Natural History, and he's a bug guy, and I thought we had a, a connection. We do, as it turns out. But my first meeting with him was really, really quite negative. Because he was talking about how you know this group of people wouldn't talk to that group of people. They had their information. The, the other group had their information. He didn't have either of those, these people's information. And I said kind of what, what you're alluding to, which is, was, you know, well, how do we get past that? Because it's not my job to get past that. It's my job to collect data. And I think at some point, everybody hits that wall, where it's like, you know, I can cure the social problems of an entire country, or I can do my job to collect data. Now, the issue with citizen science and poachers, in Singapore, it's probably less of a problem. There is a very little poaching in Singapore. Uh, some people got caught poaching a pangolin. We still have pangolins in Singapore. Um, but it's, it's not very severe. In fact, I talked to somebody last weekend who suggested we should bring helmeted hornbills back to Singapore because they're safe there, whereas the ones on like, the field site in Brunei get poached. Um, people shoot them for their tasks. Um, <clears throat> So, so I don't know what the answer is. I don't even know if there is an answer. You know, some people would say that the, the answer is to change the uh, reward structure so that you're not rewarding people for poaching food or poaching whatever it is that you're poaching. 
Um, otters have been pretty low on the list of things that get poached, although I think that's changing. And the reason it's changing, ironically, is because of cute otter videos. So the, these small plot of otters, they, I mean, they really do look like swimming kittens, right? It's, it's hard not to kind of fall in love with them. Um, and I've got a small plot of otter project that's supposed to start this semester at the zoo, at the zoo. But I think people see these and they're like, oh, I want an otter, I want an otter. You know, and I kind of want to take these people aside and say, and, and yeah, and some otters are getting moved into the pet trade, but I, I kind of want to say, look, first of all, they smell really bad. You know, <laughs> they, they smell like dead fish. You really want something that smells like dead fish in your house. You know, second of all, they get really lonely. You know, so you have an otter that's used to living in a group with 10 other otters, nine other otters, and romping around and rolling around with them, and you're going to leave it in your flat all day. You know, so yeah, this is this is a cool pet. It's true, it's going to interact with you. They're really smart, and I think they are really smart, by the way. Um, and maybe even if you want to take baths with it, you know, and then what could be better than taking a bath with an otter? Just don't even answer. <laughs> <laughs> but I think changing the reward structure, you know, and, and, and convincing people that, that no, that this isn't really a good pet. You know, it's it's it smells like a wet dog all the time. You know, and, and they eat a lot because they're active. Um, I mean, they eat a lot. They eat like kilo, kilo and a half of fish a day. Um, that's, that's a lot of fish, which is why fishermen don't like them. Um, but there, there are other things, you know, fishermen don't like them. Here's one thing that might influence that, though. Uh, I think there are two things. One is that in the group that studies these guys in Goa, they actually managed to have fishing-free parts of the shoreline to make basically otter sanctuaries. And what happened is that the surrounding fishermen's yields went up. So, the reason is because if you protect part of the, the shoreline, you get more fish. And fishermen take more fish than the otters do. Even if otters are, are eating a couple kilos of fish a day, you know, times however many, there are more fish out there. So protecting that area means the surrounding fishermen have a higher yield. If you stress that, then people might not do things like, you know, shoot otters or pour gasoline down their hole to do whatever other terrible things they, they're doing. And they are doing that because they think the otters are a threat to fish. At the same time, these guys, and I mean these guys, go into the fish ponds around Singapore. And there's one family in uh, Sungai Bulo where everybody says, oh, those are the biggest, most muscular otters in Singapore. And the reason is they can swim 100 meters to these floating fish farms and just eat you know, a lot of fish. <laughs> and at some point, that really is an economic nuisance, at the very least, and, and it can be a deal breaker. Um, the most magical story to me about otters are the fishermen in Bangladesh, where there's still a few families, 10 or 20 families, that fish with trained otters. And the otters actually chase the fish into the nets. And I talked to somebody who, who works on, I think it was a small pond of otters, I don't think it was a smooth coated one, but we, we were all concerned about abuse, because this is a practice that's been going on around the world for 600 years, and now there's just a handful of families that, that, that do it anymore. We said, you know, well, how do they treat the otters? It feels like they're children. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're economically dependent on, on these animals. It's one of these close animal people with bonds, mm -hmm. you know, maybe like falcon, falconry, or maybe like, you know, people who hunt with dogs, or people who have, who have very close relationships with horses, but, but have this very, very positive relationship with their particular otters. And I think if you have that kind of bond, you're less likely to shoot something for a skin, or shoot something, or, you know, catch something so that it can be a pet. Or, or you have these other kinds of relationships that aren't as positive. But I don't have an easy solution. Um, just out of curiosity, while studying these authors in Singapore, have you noticed them displaying any behavior which is like similar or different with their cousins in the wild? <coughs> that's a great question. And as you probably know, when a prof says that's a great question, he doesn't have an answer. Um, <coughs> that's never stopped me from talking before. So, <laughs> so, I don't study these guys in the wild, I study them in Singapore, so I personally can't compare them. Nobody studied their behavior until basically this year. I mean, not except in the grossest terms. The crew in Goa is studying their behavior with camera traps, and I'm studying them with, with camera phones. Um, and, and that's like literally all the information we have on, on their behavior, except for a few spotty uh, stories. The otter watchers claim that these guys, some of these families, don't behave the way wild otters do. I'm not sure that's true. I think there's probably variation among groups. I think it's natural variation. And I think some of that variation gives some of the authors an advantage in some circumstances. I mentioned this guy, Roland Case. He did the Candid uh, Critters book, 
which is a fun book to have on your desktop. Um, he looked at fishers. Do you know what fishers are? They're like giant weasels. They're like giant mean weasels, right? <laughs> so so they're, they're like this big, and uh, they used to be incredibly afraid of people. And if you saw a fisher, it was like a big deal. You only saw them when you were way, way out in like the Canadian Rockies. They've made their way into the suburbs of Albany, New York. Albany is a mid-sized city, not even a million people, right? And in the suburbs, the fishers are actually like coming into people's backyards. So he wanted to see how they responded to novel objects, and he wanted to find the most novel objects. So he took those pink plastic flamingos and covered them with orange spray, like orange scent, like the, the fruit orange, and put them out to see how uh, fishers responded to them. They sat them. So he, he suggests that there are different personalities in fishers, bold fishers and fearful fishers. But if you're taking advantage of an urban environment, being bold is actually an advantage. If you're trying to steal fish from a fisherman with a gun, being bold might be a disadvantage. So I think these, these kind of group level personality traits might actually influence which authors you see in cities versus which ones you see elsewhere. You know, it, it's good to be a scared otter, a scaredy cat, if people are trying to kill you. But if people are just taking pictures of you, yeah, sure, be bold, show up. Have there been any other ecological effects of either cleaning up the rivers or as a result of the ossage returning? Uh, um, could you say the second part again, please? I'm a little deaf in Oregon. Have there been any ecological effects so of um, the ossage returning? Um, it's hard to say, which is another way of saying, that's a good question. <laughs> um, people are looking at it. I think one of the effects is that these large yellow fish are much less common. You know, we've watched them basically it, it disappear. Um, and some people are really angry about that, right? You know, people fish uh, recreationally in these reservoirs. Those fish are not native. They're, they're stocked. And tilapia are in the, these reservoirs too. Again, not native. They're stocked. Um, so I don't feel bad about that. What I hope and it's, it's really hard to think about how to test this, but what I hope is that the introduction of otters increases the diversity of fishes. Because we've seen that with the introduction of other kinds of predators. That when you put a predator in, there's a keystone effect. And one of the downstream effects of increasing fish diversity, especially someplace like these big concrete troughs, I think is that we might reduce the chance of certain kinds of diseases. So my hope is that by having otters around, we're actually lowering the chance of some kind of fish outbreak. That's a really hard hypothesis to test. So I'm almost saying that out of something close to religious conviction. Um, I was just wondering, obviously with the otters being quite charismatic animals, and when you have these citizen scientists that are going around taking photos, are you at all concerned that being with them being so charismatic and with them becoming more and more habituated to the water citizen scientists and almost certainly these photographers are telling their friends who are also photographers and the numbers are going to increase. I know I've already planned to message my friend in Singapore who would almost certainly love to see these animals in their wild situations. Um, is there going to be, a, can you think of any ways in which you might be able to control that in moving forwards in the future? No, so the question, if, if you couldn't hear that or you can't hear my mic anymore, Sorry. it's okay, it's, I think this one's not working anyway. Um, was basically, am I worried about there being too many people around the otters? And the answer is yeah. And, and the same with the, the otter watchers, uh, many of them are, are honestly much more involved than I am. You know, this is why there's a certain amount of secretness. Um, I don't know if you've seen any of the videos, so you know, there are a lot of photographers in, in Singapore and it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's almost a competitive hobby to take pictures of, of rare plants, rare uh, birds, rare bugs. And what happens is, there, there are five parts of the story, what happens is you get some really cool bird, like a black bat, a kingfisher, and they migrate down this time of year to Singapore. Beautiful bird, orange and purple, really small, bright red bill, just an absolutely, absolutely gorgeous bird. So it shows up, it shows up in a predictable place, and the next day on Facebook, there are a thousand <laughs> pictures of this one bird. You know, when I first moved to the airport, I was like, oh my god, there are flocks of these things, I've got to go find them. Because, you know, just scrolling through picture after picture after picture, it's the same damn bird. You know? <laughs> and like, that sounds funny, but when you go there, what you see are, are you know, people who are roughly my age, with really nice cameras, with, you know, $5,000 camera lenses, 
all standing within two meters of this one poor bird, <laughs> you know, taking hundreds and hundreds of photos. Right? So, so yeah, it's an issue, and it's an issue because sometimes people do things that are, frankly, very unethical. Um, a doctor was recently fined two thousand Singapore dollars because he baited um, um, white-bellied sea eagle, our biggest raptor, uh, and he, he put styrofoam in dead fish and floated them out there. So that the sea eagle would catch them and he get good pictures of them. And of course, then the sea eagle is going to eat styrofoam, so it's, it's not a good thing to do. It's, and he got, he got caught because there are a thousand people around him, you know, with their cameras. And he got, he got a fine, which is what happens in Singapore. They say it's a fine city for a reason. But, um, they do. <laughs> um, but this could be a real problem. And it also feeds to the secrecy, which, is, which makes it in science hard. I don't know what to do. What I can tell you is that it's really important to work closely with the people who care about this. And, and that's something that fr I frankly have made some mistakes about. But it's really important not to, not to sort of say, you have to do it my way, or, or to you know, kind of be seen as coming in and being able to turn the part. You, know, you, you have to figure out some way that you can work with people. Because as with many things, the people who are closest to the animals are the ones who know the most about them. You know, not just where they are, but sometimes you know, they say things that that you wouldn't expect. Like I started watching these otter monitor interactions and I was fascinated. And I'll, I'll pat myself on the back. I don't think um, the otter watchers interpreted these the right way at first. But they were like, oh yeah, that happens all the time. I'm like this happens all the time. This is National Geographic stuff. Are you going, yeah, yeah, it's not a big deal. You know, they're just monitors all over the place. Like, you know, I've got videos of that. You want to see? Yeah, I want to see that. <laughs> you know? So, so you know, they knew more about the otter monitor interactions than I actually even imagined. And, and, and it's important to, to foster those. I think I just talked through the past few minutes. Um, it's probably easy to get public interest about like um, charismatic animals, right? right. But what, what about maybe something like gibbons, where you can't really see them because they're, they're in a canopy, but you can hear them? What do you think about like a conservation plan using public interest to uh, create awareness and maybe promoting um, like conservation of green spaces around um, cities? So that, the most important thing is to take these charismatic animals, and I, for example, think gibbons are incredibly charismatic. And you've got a different kind of gibbon than I'm used to, but since <laughs> I'm here, and since you mentioned it, let's see if I can pull it up. Uh, I might not be able to. works. Alright, so uh, this is a really bad video that a, a, a collaborator of mine took of it's not on the screen. Ah, why isn't it on the screen? Okay, what happened? I think you're no, I think it's Can you guys hear this? I mean, that's the only important thing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the gibbons that I have on my site are uh, Mueller's gibbons, and they've got a different pitch than the gibbons in peninsular Malaysia. This is a big male. He's about five meters from the guy who's recording this. <coughs> Right, so it's hard to see these, but it's hard not to call that charismatic, right? It's, it's amazing, the sound. And, and uh, I, think, I think you really hit the important point. And the important point is that we want to use charismatic, and I don't want to be too didactic, but we do. We want to use these charismatic animals as a reason to, to conserve green space. That's a big issue right now in Singapore. They're talking about building an MRT station through one of the last large patches of forest. Since I've been there, three or four of the small patches of forest that are left, and that's like you know two percent of, of what's left of, of Singapore forests are gone, and and you know what they're going to build are, are condos or flats, um, and so it, it's a it's a major concern. There are people worried about it, 
Um, how to do that, I don't know. I can tell you that with the macaques in Singapore, they're docents, right? They're people who volunteer to, to basically lead educational tours. We've got three primates in Singapore. Um, we've got some kind of um, langer, I can't actually remember what kind. Uh, some kind of, we've got the long-tailed macaques that you've got here. You guys have two or three kinds of macaques here. And we've got um, Sundus uh which are very rare. And one of these small patches of forest that they just mowed down had some of the slow lorises and also had pangolins. You know, and people like me are up in arms, right? Not literally, because you're not allowed to do that. But, but we're furious about it. They also had two of the last natural streams. My flies live near streams. And there is supposed to be one endemic Singaporean stock eyed fly, which I haven't found yet. So losing natural streams is, is especially close to me. But I think you're absolutely right that, that you know, the issue isn't just, oh, can we save authors? It's that in drawing attention to authors, can we save mangroves? Or in drawing attention to um, uh, kingfishers, can we save some of these old trees that are snags? Because cities don't like snags, but animals do. Um, and I don't know what the solution is. I have a question. So when it comes to uh, a country, development is a must. So, do you think it's possible to integrate wildlife with development so that we humans and animals can live harmoniously? Is it a, a thing? Is it possible? Oh God, I hope so. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I really do. Part of the reason I'm interested in the resurgence of carnivores in urban environments is exactly that. You know, and, and it, it is tricky. It's, it's really, you know, um, some of my students went to the Himalayas and they actually got, I can't believe it, they got camera phone footage, video footage of snow leopards. They got snow leopards on camera phones. And, and one of the students who did this is, is this very small young woman who, you know, is 20 meters away from a cat that weighs more than she does. Um, and it's, it's the sort of thing where I was like, what are you, an idiot? <laughs> you know, and I was, I, was, I was really, really surprised and touched. But what the cat was doing was laying on top of a horse that it had killed. And it was a villager's horse. Right, so it was somebody's horse who was grazing in the wrong part. And you can't tell somebody, look, the snow leopard is more important than the livelihood, right? As much as, as from my point of view, that may or may not be true. But there's got to be some middle ground, and I don't know what it is. Um, I think, you know, I think there's, unfortunately, I think we're just going to lose a lot of things. And, and I don't want to sound negative about that, but I think it's true. But I think there's also a certain sorting process. You know, if you have large enough green spaces in the areas, then you've got room for bold fishers, you've got room for otters that are willing to, to live with people. Some of it is, is ironically that you know, in urban areas or suburban areas, you have fewer people whose livelihood depends on things like having a horse or having livestock or having things like that, which allows for those animals to live a little bit more harmoniously. Having said that, people in LA know that if they leave their small, and people in LA have really small dogs, know that if they leave their cat or small dog outside, there's a good chance that it's going to get eaten by a coyote. You know, and and those, again, this amazes me because when I was a kid, even when I was your age, urban coyotes was an oxymoron, saying, oh yeah, urban coyotes. It would have sounded like you know you were doing something unusual. It, it just wouldn't have sounded right. I don't know what the answer is. Um, I don't know the answer. One more question. This is a very personal question for me. Okay. Like we as millennials, what do you think the mindset that we should take to further uh, improve the, the the studies and maybe help change the world? Oh. <laughs> oh. Um, seriously, th things are going to things aren't going to improve without an enormous collective effort. And things are probably going to you know, degrade more. One of the things that, that honestly kind of breaks my heart is moving here, being super excited to be you know, right near the forest where my animals live. And my first fall here, you know, I couldn't see the tops of the buildings where I worked because of the haze. You know, <laughs> what's the haze? Oh, they're burning down in forests. You know, and flying in here, you guys know this too, flying in here and especially, especially here. You know, I see rows and rows and rows and rows of palm, oil palm. You know, it's a green desert. Having said that, there are probably worse things that you can plant, right? I mean, oil palm is better than parking lots. Um, but, but where that balance is, I, I, 
I don't know. I think what, what you have to do is you have to you, know, you have to maintain some optimism because it's really easy. And I think it's really easy for smart people and really easy for people of a certain age to be cynical. And as soon as you start being cynical, then it's easy to kind of give up. As soon as you, you sort of think, oh, you know, what's the use? Or, oh, I don't really believe that this, you know, fill-in-the-blank official is, is working on my side. Or, oh, I, I just don't prioritize people who have livestock, who have jobs, who depend on development. You know, once you start getting that kind of cynical attitude, then, then it's hard to say, okay, you know, then what do we do next? Like, you need that hope. You need some sincerity, too, along with that hope. Okay, unless there's any other questions out there, I have some two questions to Philip. Uh, my first question is, uh, from we saw the video, the videos that uh, the otters are very adapted to the urban environment. They live in concrete troughs, they, they have their uh, they resting places under the, under the freeways and things like that. Recently we had a chat where we were talking about how Singapore is going to be renaturalizing some of its concrete troughs by trying to make them more like natural streams and sort of taking them away from the concrete troughs. How do you think that might impact the otters, which are so adapted to the urban environment and they're eating invasive fish and stuff like that? How do you think a more natural environment will affect these otter populations? Um, are they higher than they naturally would be right now? And the second question is sort of where we ended at, which is um, otters are great because uh, even though they might economically harm some, some individuals, such as fishermen, uh, for most people, especially people who have a lot of clout in society, so uh, upper middle class individuals, they're great because they can uh, they can get pictures, they can get phones, there are no harm to them or their families and things like that. But for your uh, dream of sort of reintroducing leopards into Singapore, whether that's going to happen or not, <laughs> we know that in places like California in the western United States, where there's always been mountain lions and coyotes, coming down coming back to the city, urban areas, is not as big a step as opposed to on the east coast of the United States where uh, wolves and mountain lions have been gone for a century or more, there's much more resistance towards reintroducing these animals, even in wild areas, forget urban areas. So how do you think uh, a public reintroduction of anything that might even be remotely da dangerous to uh, children in Singapore might go as compared to the reintroduction of others? I'll answer the second question first, because I forgot the first question. Um, so the second question is, we can see what happens. So you know, people in the US reintroduced wolves into Yellowstone um, 25, 30 years ago. And the effects on Ye Yellowstone have been almost universally positive. Um, you know, there's greater biodiversity, there's greater plant biodiversity, there's greater bird biodiversity. The rivers and streams there are in better shape. You know, it's hard to look at almost any facet and say, oh, it's gotten worse because of wolves. The only thing potentially is that there are fewer of some kinds of deer that people like to hunt. But when those wolves walk off of the, the park, they get shot. People shoot them right away, right? And, and cattle ranchers, people who, who make their living, don't want to see wolves. Um, in some states, including New York, I think it's it's legal to, and again, there, there are much, obviously much different laws about gun ownership and things like hunting, but it's legal to shoot um, dogs that are unlicensed. And uh, this is supposed to keep packs of wild dogs from roaming around. Um, but, but people are, are using this to also shoot wolves or wolf-like animals, and they're, they're saying, oh, I thought it was a wild dog. Um, yeah, people people don't like that, and, and, and I don't know kind of what to do about that. Um, I'm not going to reintroduce leopards this trip. Um, <laughs> <laughs> until I can carry one of my carry on bag. But uh, yeah, and, and you know, I'm joking about that, but, but it's an um, issue even with coyotes. You know, coyotes are small dogs. If you guys don't know what coyotes are, they weigh 15 kilos in the west, they weigh about 20, maybe 22 kilos in the east of the US. Uh, the ones in the east of the US have hybridized with Canadian wolves and they actually have a phenotype. And it's a big, long story, which is really cool. Um, but people who are not familiar with coyotes, and you can see them, you can see them in suburban neighborhoods. You know, they're in, I grew up in Washington, D.C., on the east coast. And their coyotes in DC, and when I heard this, I thought the person who was telling me this was, you know, having some kind of nervous breakdown. But, I, <laughs> but I, I've seen them. It's really amazing. Um, and if you talk to people who aren't familiar with coyotes, first of all, they'll describe them as being big dogs. They're not. They're little dogs. And the second thing they'll talk about is how there have been lots of coyote attacks. To the best of my knowledge, there have been two 
reported coyote attacks in the last 100 years. There have been lots of interactions with coyotes, because they're dogs, they're smart, but where a, a coyote has actually attacked a person has been incredibly, incredibly rare. And that's one thing to emphasize. But the other thing is, you know, these are predators, right? And predators do attack things. And coyotes especially eat cats and dogs, because cats are easy to catch. What was the first question? Okay, so my first question was, uh, for the single fathers, which are so adapted to the urban environment, to live under concrete bridges and swim in concrete troughs and eat invasive fish, what would happen if, uh, sort of, if the renaturalization of the streams happened? How would that affect otter numbers? Right. Are they higher than they normally would? Right, so, so I think the first question is, are the otters above carrying capacity now? And my guess is no. Um, my guess is, I think we've got six, maybe eight families around Singapore, but uh, by way of example, there's a river that's uh, maybe two kilometers from the west of me, um, which I think, if I got, if I have the the Jurong, that goes into a, this ornamental garden. And there's a new pair of otters in that ornamental garden, and they're the only otters anybody's seen on that river. So I think that's going to be a family in a year or so. Um, so the first question is, have we reached carrying capacity? I don't think we have. I mean, the otters have only really established themselves in the last two, maybe four or five years. Um, they're new. Are they going to be bothered by the renaturalizations of the stream? No, I don't think so. And the reason I think not is because I think, if anything, having you know grassy semi-natural banks in the stream will improve the water quality more. What that's going to do to fish, I don't know. But honestly, I think a lot of the fish get in there because people put them there. And, and I don't just mean parks. I mean other people, too. You know, when I go to the place where I watch otters, and I go early in the morning, there are older people who are throwing breadcrumbs to the fish next to their flats. Um, the uh, <laughs> but those fish aren't there, aren't begging for fish, aren't for breadcrumbs because they're wild fish. 